feel it's, uh, it's definitely appropriate to wait for the last click. <laughs> this week, uh, one of my youth group kids uh, from my previous church down in Brisbane uh, actually won a competition. Um, part of the Melbourne Institute of uh, Comedy, you know, the Melbourne Comedy Festival. Well, she actually uh, threw a hat in the ring. She's 16 years old. She threw a hat in the ring and she won it, this, this event. And I thought that I might just try out because obviously she's got some really good mentors and teachers and things like that, myself perhaps included. I thought I'd try out uh, a little bit on us just to get us going this morning. Look, I was, uh, I was trying to figure out how to, how to start my message, but I kept coming up empty, kind of like, the tomb on Sunday. Righto. I was going to uh, kind of wait for that one until Sunday. I thought people might get a little cross. It's getting better. We're just warming up. No, uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's really, it's really cool. I, I love Easter. Uh, I love everything about Easter. I love hot cross buns. I love chocolate. Um, mainly the, the blocks of Cadbury chocolate. I reckon I, I can put one of those away in a sitting. I do that pretty well. But Easter for me is the ultimate. It's the ultimate demonstration of God's love to us. And it describes to me, it just, it shows me the lengths that God would be willing to go that I might have a relationship with Him, that I could be saved, that I could have an eternity that is secure in Him. And the beauty about it is that there's no effort that I could personally go to that would enable my salvation. But it's only because of what He's done that we can actually do that. So I celebrate hard Easter. I get excited and as an evangelist, I get super passionate and it's sometimes overwhelming for people. And I just start arguments um, with people about the way that we do things in the Christian church. I had an amazing argument about the fact that, you know, we don't see the joy of the Lord expressed on people's faces with our interns on Wednesday morning. That lasted quite a while. But I think that we have something that is worth, maybe just smirking a little bit to the side if we can't get a full smile out. I think we've got something that is amazing that we get the opportunity to celebrate, particularly today, Good Friday, what he's done. In Matthew uh, chapter 27, if you wanna follow along, uh, you're welcome to grab your own Bibles. I've got the verses up on the screen for us This morning, but it says this from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all of the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, he filled it with wine vinegar put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rock split. And the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Could you imagine that happening? How much you would freak out. All these people that have died have now been raised to life, such as the power of Jesus coming alive in this moment. What he's done. 
But I wanna focus in this morning on one particular element of this text, and it is this bit. It says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. No gospel actually stops to explain this. It appears in them all, but none of them stop to to really explain what's just happened here in this moment. You see, the veil was the inner veil in the temple before the holy of holy rooms. That was the room where God dwelt. Nobody was allowed in there except for the high priest. Only once a year were they ever allowed in there. This particular veil has been described and attributed as 30 feet by 30 feet in dimension and as thick as up to four inches. It's woven, it's put together well. This was an ultimate act of worship in just putting this together. And in the tabernacle, the tabernacle, it was blue and purple and scarlet, finely twisted with cherubim worked into it. It was put together by skilled workers. In Solomon's temple, we read it, it's blue and purple and crimson, yarn and fine linen with cherubim worked into it. These colours of the temple veil are associated with divinity. They're associated with royalty in the ancient Near East culture. And so Yahweh was both sacred as a deity, but also royal and kingly in His existence. He was enthroned as the King of Israel. And then they've got these cherubim that are woven into it. Fierce, angelic warriors with ferocious swords. And that stands between man and God. To serve as both a warning and an object lesson. We cannot be in the presence of God. The way is shut. You might recall in the garden, the cherubim are there stopping Adam and Eve once they have been removed from the garden. They stand as fierce warriors that stop us from being fully in the presence of God represented on this massive, massive veil that separates humanity from where God's dwelling is. We're closed off. We've been shut out. Been shut out from the presence of God. So how did it all happen? How did it all happen? How did we get to this stage where we are no longer able to be in the presence of God? Well, God can't be in the presence of unrighteousness. God can't be in the presence of unholiness. And so for an unrighteous and unholy people, God's wrath would be poured out upon us if we entered beyond the curtain. The wrath which looks like death. 
Problem is that none of us are immune to it. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin, none of us are immune to this curse of death that exists. None of us are immune to the the fact that we are separated from God. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. This is what happened when sin entered through that one man, right? Through Adam, through Eve, through mankind. When sin entered, we now knew the difference between good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden garden of Edom, cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Disconnected. There's, There's no nothing. Some of the younger people here probably don't even know what this even is. There is no ability for us to connect in such a way that it would be acceptable for us to be in the presence of God under the curse of sin. But, and I love this, But in Exodus 25, verse 8, as God's people gathered, this happened. God gave instructions, then have them make me a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. All of the sudden, we start to see the beginning of hope for the broken. We start to see a pathway forward where God would meet with His people. We start to see what He's done in just the beginnings of His redemptive plan as He sets up and establishes a place amongst the people where He exists and dwells. Exodus 25, 22, there above the cover between the two cherubim, that are over the Ark of the Covenant of the Law, I will meet with you and give you my commands for the Israelites. Not only did God set up a dwelling place, He meets with us. He gives us commands again. He tells us how we should live our lives in accordance with His will and His desires. Kind of problematic in that we still couldn't manage to do it. Yet God dwells among His people. And right from then through to today, God dwells amongst His people. What He's done. God dwells in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle and the temple. He meets us on the other side of the veil, guarded by the cherubim. So holy was this dwelling place that no one could enter. And I'm sorry to burst bubbles, but some people believe that the high priest actually had a rope tied around him when he went into the Holy of Holies. He had little jingle bells. He had bells on him. But so holy was this space that even if they, the people believe, even if the high priest died, that they would have to find a way to know and therefore extract the high priest. And so once a year, God enabled this meeting to take place on the Day of Atonement. And atonement is the only way 
for us to come back to God. The price for the sin, the brokenness that entered into the world through Adam and Eve and has been carried generation to generation, the price still needed to be paid. Just like the covenantal law required a sacrifice for this sin, which was another purpose of the temple that people could come and bring their offerings, their sacrifice to be made right before God. We as a human race, as mankind, needed the ultimate sacrifice to be paid, a sacrifice that could only be made because of what He's done. Jesus became the sacrifice. Isaiah 53, his life was a ransom for many. Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice so that we might know God, that we might be able to interact with God, that we could sense and know God's dwelling place amongst his people. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. And Jesus had to become the ultimate sacrifice because there was no sacrifice that could compete, that could actually achieve the magnitude of the price that needed to be paid. Hear this in Hebrews 10 verses three to seven, it says, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. The Old Testament practice of coming and sacrificing before God was never able to fully forgive for sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, He said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then he said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Throw forward to the garden, not my will, but your will be done. Voluntary submission by Jesus Christ to the will of the Father, that he would be the ultimate sacrifice, that he would end the Old Testament sacrificial system by fulfilling it, by becoming the ultimate sacrifice that paid the penalty for each and every person yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The price has now been paid. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their mind. Then he adds, the sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer Necessary. What does it mean? It means that we now have access, full access to God. As Jesus was on the cross enacting God's will, enacting what was prophesied about, He paid the price for us. He gives us an opportunity at being made right with God. Because the veil was torn from top to bottom.
God did it. God tore the veil. It wasn't torn from the bottom up. Humans couldn't tear it. God broke in, broke out, and now dwells amongst His people. Access to God has now been restored. Every one of us has direct access to our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, because of what He did on the cross. The cherubim have been removed. It's done away with. Love is demonstrated in its entirety. We are no longer closed off to God in the way that we were before, but we have full access, life and life in abundance. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. In Jesus, there is hope for the hopeless. There is purpose for the lost. There is rest for the weary, peace for the anxious, atonement for the sinner. There is life for the lifeless. If that doesn't get us excited, then I'm not sure that anything will this Easter long weekend. Maybe the hot cross buns on Sunday after service. But that's what He has done. Jesus did it all for us. He has done it all for you. He has done it all for me. And if you were the only person on this earth and sin entered, He would do it all over again because He loves you. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved, He did it out of love. He wants relationship with you and me. And perhaps this Easter long weekend, whether this is your first time in church, whether this is your hundred thousandth time in church, I don't know how that's possible. Jesus wants you to know that you are so deeply and dearly loved and that Jesus made a way for you to be right in the eyes of God. And He wants to be in relationship with you. The veil has been torn. There is no other sacrifice that is needed. The cherubim aren't blocking us from the presence of God anymore. He's done it all. What He's done. What He's done. The good news is that on Sunday, He is risen. Death wasn't the end for Jesus. In fact, death for those in relationship with God isn't the end for us either. We are raised to life just as Jesus was that Sunday, that Easter Sunday, Jesus was raised to life by the power of God. It's a story of the beginning. It's a story of the brokenness. It's a story of betrayal. And it's a story of a new beginning. Perhaps today is your day for a new beginning. The question that I have for you is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? After our service this morning, there is no cafe. We want you to go and we want you to celebrate what Jesus has done this weekend with your friends and your family and those around you. We also want you to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ because of what He's done. What are you going to do about it? Because just like this morning's service, it is finished.